Example 4.8. Find the work done by the electric field F 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared by x, y, z. So this is a vector field that is an electric field from the point 1, 0, 0 to the point 1, 1, 1. Okay, so what we can do here is write and it helps to know something about parameterization. So this is part of why I've been including some extra videos on geometric thinking because in part it does include some parameterization discussion, but if you need more, I would suggest that you have a look at um, chapter six and go and see some videos from that section on parameterization, at least the first section of it, so you get a good idea of what I'm talking about. Okay, so we can write, a linear path from zero or one zero zero to one 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 as the curve C, which is R of T equal to so along the line from you know from zero 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 to one one one, I can describe points on this line via a parameter t. And so that would look like this. Okay, and so what I'm describing in this vector r is if this is the well actually that happens to be the origin but more generally if this is the origin then it's a vector from the origin to a point okay so this is a linear path now when t equals zero we get R of zero is one, zero, zero. So the vector from the origin to the point, oh, I see, yeah, yeah, this should be a one, right? So yes, I can put the origin here and call that different. All right, so um, from the origin to the point gives us a vector. So that's why I can call this a vector, but it also describes a point. All right, now when t is equal to one, so r of one is, just subbing in there, we've got one, one, one. So we get both of our endpoints and we get points in between by choosing some value of t between zero and one. So t is between zero and one. And so this is a parameterization of a linear path from this point to this point. Okay, so now that we have that, let's consider work done along that path, which is given by f dot dr. But we can write this in a different way. We can say that this is the integral from t equals 0 to t equals 1 of f of r of t dot dr on dt dt. All right. Now, if this is r, then differentiating this with respect to t gives us 0, 1, 1. Okay, so that's that part of it. Now, f of r of t, well, if x is 1, y is t, and z is t, then subbing into this, we have 1 over 1 plus t squared plus t squared, which is 2t squared, and then 
one t t. Now remember, we're taking a dot product, so we need to express that there. Okay, so this part in front, that's a scalar function. This entire thing is a vector function. So taking the dot product of these two, we can actually keep this out the front and take the dot product of these two. So then we've got the integral from zero to one, one on one plus two t squared. Now taking the dot product, we have zero plus t plus t. Okay, so this is two t. So work done is the integral from zero to one of two t over one plus two t squared dt. So now we have an integral of one variable. Now to do this or complete this integral, notice that the derivative of the denominator is four t. So we really want this to be a four t, not a two t so that we can take this integral as the log or natural logarithm of one plus two t squared. So we want to introduce another two, but doing so requires us to make up for it by putting a half in front. Okay, now if you want to see the details of this, it would be a substitution, and that substitution would be letting u be equal to 1 plus 2t squared. Okay, you know what, I probably have enough room to do the complete thing here and not just tell you that this is the natural logarithm of 1 plus 2t squared, right? So let's go ahead and do this. So if we let u equal this, then we've got a half integral. Now on the denominator we have u. Now notice that the derivative of u with respect to t is, so du on dt is 4t. Okay, and so then we want to replace dt with du over 4t. So this is du over 4t, and here we have a 4t as well. Now, as soon as we put in a du or make that substitution, we've got to change the numbers here as well. So u as a function of t equals zero is equal to one, and u as a function of t equals one is one plus two is three. So this is one to three. Okay, now we can cancel the four t. We have one half integral of u to the power of minus one du from one to three. Okay, now we can clearly see that this is the natural logarithm of u. So one half log, and I mean natural log when I write that, log of u, but I'm going to sub in the three, so log of three minus log of one. Now log of one is zero, so this is just one half of log three. So work done should be a half log three. Okay, now if you wanna see a reference for the result here that I'm using, I think it's Stuart from memory page 1095 of the seventh edition. And that's just because that's the copy I have. So if you've got a different edition, probably in the same range, or somewhere around this page number. Okay, let's move on to the next page, the curl of a vector field. The curl of a vector field is a mathematical operation that produces another vector field. So we're looking at this in terms of the del operator cross f. Now remember that the del operator was this
taking a cross product of that with say PQR okay now to do that remember in aid to memory we put an I a J a K hat there then we write this in the second row and that's hard to do here because I don't have much space you probably don't much have much either and then we've got PQR that goes in the bottom all right, well, when you actually take that cross product, and it's not a real cross product because this is a diff differential operator in there, right? But this is in aid to memory. So when you take this cross product, you've got this 2 by 2 determinant times i hat, which is a placeholder, incidentally. And so that's the partial derivative of r with respect to y minus the partial derivative of q with respect to z. Okay, so that's the first component because i hat is a placeholder. So we have R, Y minus Q, Z there. All right, and let's just set this out again. Okay, now remember to take a determinant, you cover this up take the 2 by 2 determinant, multiply it by this. Then subtract, covering up this column and this row. So this, the product of these minus the product of these. So this operating on R, because remember, it's not a real determinant. It's just an aid to memory of what curl is. So that's the partial derivative of R with respect to X minus the partial derivative of P with respect to Z. And then the minus sign, because this is the second one, swaps that order around. So we then have PZ minus RX. And then finally, crossing out the column and the row that the K is in, we have this little two by two determinant to calculate. So that is the partial derivative of Q with respect to X minus the partial derivative of P with respect to y, so what we have there. Now, if you want to, you can do you can do it this way every time when you calculate the curl of a vector field, right? And many people do, because it's like you don't have to remember much to do that, right? So this, you have to remember more, but it's possibly easier to calculate because you don't have to worry about the i's and j's and k's. You just straight away get um, your vector field. Curl of F is another vector field. Okay, so let's go back up here. It's a mathem mathematical operation that produces another vector field. It describes the tendency of the original vector, vector field to rotate around a given point in space. More precisely, the curl measures the amount of circulation or rotation of a vector field at each point in space. All right, so here's our definition. Physically, the curl of a vector field describes the tendency of a fluid or electromagnetic field to rotate around a given point. This feels repetitive, okay. For example, the curl of a velocity field describes the tendency of a fluid to swirl around a point. So again, imagine a river and a, and a vortex in a river. So if you had that as a vector field, you could calculate the curl, and measuring that curl would tell you um, the rotation and, in fact, which way it goes, clockwise or counterclockwise. While the curl of an electromagnetic field describes the tendency of the field to rotate around a charged particle, the curl of a vector field will point in the direction of the axis of spin according to the right-hand rule. So let me introduce you to that in the context of curl. So right hand, okay, this is the direction of the curl. And then this, curl this around to the right. So this is the direction of the flow of the vector field. So for example, if you have a, uh, a vortex in a river with a counterclockwise from the top rotation, then the curl of that vector field would be a vector that points up out of the page. Okay, let's have a look at example 
let f be y comma minus x comma one. Now see figure 22, and I'll remind you of what that looked like. It had a clockwise rotation like this. Okay, and so um, according to this, the curl should be a vector that points into the page according to the right-hand rule. You see this? You make the your fingers on your right hand only match up with the arrows, and then your thumb points in the direction of curl F. All right, and conversely, if you know curl F, then you know the rotation because you match up the direction with your thumb and then your fingers, as they curl around, tell you the rotation of that vortex, for example, if there is one. All right, so calculate curl of F. All right, so I'm going to use this because I feel like it's easier, but if you want to use this, go for it. So we have P is Y, we have Q is minus X, and we have R is one. Okay, so curl of F equals, just looking at that, we've got R subscript Y minus Q subscript Z, P subscript Z minus R subscript X, Q subscript X minus P subscript Y. Fantastic. Okay, so R subscript Y, differentiating this one with respect to Y just gives zero. So we have zero minus Q subscript Z, so differentiating this partially with respect to Z also gives zero. P subscript Z, so differentiating Y with respect to Z partially gives zero. Differentiating R with respect to X gives zero, so zero minus zero in the second component of curl of F. Now Q subscript X, differentiating minus X with respect to X is minus one. P subscript Y, differentiating Y with respect to Y partially just gives one, so we've got minus one there. So we see that zero, zero, minus two. All right, so if this looks something like figure 22, right? So you see that this, with respect to the X, Y axes, this is minus two K hat. So it points in the opposite direction of the z-axis. So according to the right-hand rule with respect to axes, x, y, z, so z comes out of the page this way, the z-axis, right? Okay, so this curl being 0, 0, minus 2 says that the curl vector points into the page, the opposite direction of the z-axis. And I've drawn a z there, but that should be a y. All right, so we say that the vector f is irrotationable, irrotational if curl f is zero everywhere. Now, so remember the word incompressible. That was when div f was zero everywhere. So curl f equals zero everywhere also has a name. It's irrotational. Because if, there's, if the curl is zero everywhere, there's no curl. So that say, says that there's no rotation anywhere. Example 4.10. Let F be the vector field X, Y, 1. See figure 26. Show that F is irrotational. So we have to set out a P, a Q, and an R. Okay, matching that. And curl F is, what was it, R, Y minus Q, Z. Then we have P, Z minus R, X. Then we have Q, X minus P, Y. Okay, so R subscript Y, zero. Q subscript Z is also zero. 
P subscript Z is zero. R subscript X is zero. Q subscript X is zero. And P subscript Y is zero. So the curl is the zero vector. And that does not depend on the point X, Y, Z. So this is zero everywhere. So F is irrotational. Okay, following important results on vector fields. If F has continuous second partials, then curl of grad F is the zero vector. See, that's bold. So it's the zero vector. So we put grad F is Fx, Fy, Fz, which is PQR, and calculate curl of grad F. So curl of grad F is Ry minus QZ, etc. So, you know, just the rule. Okay, now subbing in, replacing P with F subscript X, replacing Q with F subscript Y, and replacing R with F subscript Z. Calculating this. So this is F Z Y minus F Y Z, etc. Okay, now Clarout's theorem says that if the Second, par second order partial derivatives are continuous and they exist, then this is equal to this, and so on, right? And so all of those vanish, and we have the zero vector. So what you know then is if, if the vector field uppercase F is a gradient field, then curl of F is the zero vector. Okay, so let's just note this here. So if uppercase F is a gradient field, meaning, remember, it's grad F for some function F, then curl of F is the zero vector. Theorem 8, if F is conservative, then curl of F equals zero. Okay, now remember the theorem earlier said that if F is a gradient field, then F is conservative. And so hence, from this calculation right here, or this one up here actually, uh, we would have curl F is zero. Conversely, if F defined on R3 has continuous partial derivatives and curl is the zero vector, then F is conservative. If F is defined on another domain U, then the converse holds when U is simply connected. Okay, so in other words, up here, this statement here was about three space, but if you do this more generally, the converse holds, you know, and this is the converse if F has continuous partial derivatives and the curl is zero, then F is conservative. So this converse holds on another domain U when U is simply connected. So you'll have to look up what that means, right? So that would be a little bit of a rabbit hole for you to go down, okay. But I'll leave it at this, and so we'll continue, consider this only on three space. If F has continuous second partial derivatives, then div of curl of F is zero. And again, you can verify this in a way like what we did up here, which might be a good exercise for you. Okay, let's jump into Green's theorem. So Green's theorem in the plane, um, and there's also Stokes' theorem for three-dimensional vector fields. Green's theorem is a fundamental result in vector calculus that relates the line integral of a vector field around a simple closed curve C to a double integral of the curl of the same vector field over the region enclosed by C. 
So you might need to refresh something on parameterization because we do briefly bring it up here. Now that is in chapter six. So if you just need to look at chapter 6.1, that'd probably be plenty. Okay, theorem 10. So Stokes theorem is this, All right? So Stokes, and then this down here is Greens. Let F equal to PQR be a vector field where P, Q, and R are continuous in a domain D, and P, Y, Q, X, etc. are continuous in S. Then we have the integral um, of F dot DR around C, where C is taken counterclockwise can be changed for a double integral involving curl of f dot n dA. Okay, and I'm just bringing this up as sort of motivation for the need of curl. It's one of the applications of curl. So I'm not going to go into too many details on this at this point. It's just here's an application of curl. Okay, so now let's draw a little picture. So We've got a curve, C being this. Okay, so the integral of the vector field around this closed curve, and that's what this little circle means, says that this curve is closed. Uh, we can trade this in for a double integral of some surface where that's the boundary. So this, you know, and I'm drawing a three-dimensional picture here. So S with C being the boundary. And then down here, matching this edge on the XY plane, we might have D. Okay, now normal to that surface, let's draw an example. That's n, our vector n, perpendicular to the edge of that surface at the point. So we can trade this in. Um, we can trade in the integral of f around this closed curve for a double integral involving the curl of f. Okay, now uh, the analog for closed curves in the plane is Green's theorem. If f is equal to pq, then in the xy plane, and again, let's draw a picture for this. So I'm going to, let's see, draw a little line separating these two things. All right, so suppose we have a counterclockwise curve, c, and then inside that, is the region D. Okay, and then we have some vector field, something like this, and we might want to be calculating work done in moving a particle around that closed curve, right? So that would be this calculation, but Green's theorem says is you, you can trade this in for a double integral over the region D. We're inside the double integral is qx minus py. Now down here is an example of this. So dr is an infinitesimal vector tangent to c. The double integral is taken over the region d and dA is an infinitesimal area element in the plane. All right, let's have a look at an example. So you probably don't see these arrowheads too well, but I'll draw them bigger. So here, is our curve C. Inside is the region D, that rectangular region. Okay, now on the next page we're going to calculate, using Green's theorem, the work done by the force field F equal to y minus xy comma x squared and moving an object counterclockwise around that region. So how much work is it to do that? 
Okay, so let's redraw some of this. So here we've got zero, zero. Then over here we've got a point two, zero. Up here, two, one. And over here, zero, one. Inside is D. And the curve C is this curve counterclockwise along the boundary. Now each of these little line segments can easily be parameterized. And again, we'll see how to do this in section six or chapter six. I don't know what to call that. So let's just see an application of Green's theorem here. So um, the region is X goes from zero to two. Have a look, zero to two. And then Y goes from zero to one. 0 to 1. So this is the region D inside. All right, now work done in moving a particle around this path inside this force field is the closed integral over C of F dot dr. Okay, now Green's theorem says that I can swap this single integral around this for a double integral over the region D, Q subscript X minus P subscript Y, DX, DY. Okay, have a look. That's what we have here. I can swap this for this. All right, now P is equal to Y minus XY, and Q is equal to X squared. So differentiating P with respect to Y partially gives us 1 minus X. Okay, now Q subscript X is just 2X. Right, so now this is the integral over D of 2X minus 1 minus X in brackets and then DX dy. All right, so now this region says that x goes from 0 to 2, so we can put 0 to 2. y goes from 0 to 1. Put 0 and 1 there. And now let's go ahead and simplify. That double integral. So we have the integral of 2x minus um, 1 plus x, so that would be 3x plus 1 dx dy. Okay, integrating 3x plus 1, we have 3 over 2x squared plus x, and that's as x goes from 0 to 2, and then we've got to integrate the result with respect to y. Okay, so subbing in the 2, we've got 3 over 2 times 2 squared is 4, so 4 divided by 2 is 2, so th 3 times 2 is 6. Uh, 6. Is this right? Um, that should be a minus, no wonder. So that makes this a minus. Okay, so 6 minus 2 is 4. And then we're subtracting what happens when we sub in 0, but of course that's just 0. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of 4 with respect to y. Okay, so that's 4y, y equals 0, y equals 1, and this just gives us 4 minus 0, which is 4. So the work done is four units, and if it's in the appropriate SI units, I guess that's, um, is it joules? I don't remember. Okay, so it's, it's four of the appropriate units, and I think it's joules.
Now, um, without Green's Theorem, if you didn't have Green's Theorem to do this, what you would have to do is parameterize each of, the, each of those paths. So let's say without Green's Theorem, you could still do it, but you would have to parameterize each of the paths, right? So we would have to parameterize 0, 0 to 2, 0. And to do that, remember, so we would write this as the path R of T is equal to, let's see, what is this? Um, I'm going to put t comma zero for t between zero and two. That would parameterize that linear path right there. So, and then the next one, so going from here to here, I could write that um, two comma t, right? But then I would want to adjust that t value so that it seems to carry on and I can think of that t as if it were time. Right? So anyway, I would have to parameterize each of the paths. And we are going to do that later in s after section 6.1 some somewhere in there. Okay, I have to parameterize this and other line segments along along C and calculate this, right? Without using Green's theorem there. So that's F of R of T. You know what? Subbing in the parameterization there and then replacing this with dr on dt dt so this say this uh, curve c would be broken up into four parts and you would have four little integrals to calculate and add together right but presumably you would also get four right this just makes it significantly easier to do that calculation of the work done in taking a particle along this path in this force field okay next example on Green's Theorem. Use Green's Theorem to evaluate the line integral, this one, counterclockwise along the closed curve C consisting of a triangle with vertices 0, 0, 1, 3, and 0, 3. So we want to draw a picture of this. And again, for this, for the moment, we're just treating this as motivation um, for why we need some of those tools. Curl. because it makes these calculations of work done easier. All right, so let's sketch our region. So now we've got a point zero, zero. We have a point one, three. And then we have a point zero, three. Let's bring our y-axis up higher. Okay, let's sketch the boundaries. Color in the boundaries. Inside this is the region D. So if it's counterclockwise, then these line segments are going counterclockwise, something like this. All right, so what we're doing essentially is calculating a work done in some vector field of moving a particle along this path counterclockwise through some vector field. Right, and so to see what vector field that is, let's rewrite this in a slightly different way. So we have the integral 
And so this is C, this closed curve. That's what this little circle means. It means that that's closed. You, you start where you finish. And so we can write this little thing here inside as a dot product. So we've got x squared, y squared, comma, 4xy cubed, dot dx, comma, dy. Right now, this part of it is our dr. This is f. All right, super. So f is x squared, y squared, comma, 4xy cubed, and let's call that p, comma, q. Okay, so if we're going to use Green's theorem here to calculate the work done uh, in moving that particle counterclockwise along this path in this force field, say this is our force field, well then what we need to do is take partial derivatives of P and Q. All right, so what we need is, so the integral, over C of F dot dr is the double integral over the region D of qx minus py and then we'll put dy dx because you can swap that around in this case. So calculating the derivative of q with respect to x, we have uh, just 4y cubed. Now differentiating p with respect to y, we have 2x squared y. Okay, now we need to describe this region inside this closed curve. So it's pretty clear to see that x goes from 0 to 1, right? 0 and 1, right? x is between 0 and 1. So d is the set of all x, y, such that x is between 0 and 1. Now, what about y? So y is between 0 and 3, but it's actually above the line uh, y equals 3x. So the way we express that is we say since y is above the line um, y equals 3x, we put y is greater or equal to 3x, saying that it's above the line. Now y is less than or equal to 1, or sorry, 3. See, there's our 3 up there. Okay, so having described that region D in more details, we can replace that here with specific bounds. Um, so the integral is now the x's go from 0 to 1, the y's go from 3x to 3. Okay, and now we can just calculate. So integrating this with respect to y, we have uh, y to the power of 4 minus x squared y squared. And so this, be careful, that's y equals 3x and y equals 3. And then in the result, we've got to integrate that with respect to x. Okay, so we have then integral from 0 to 1. Now 3 to the power of 4 is the same as 9 squared, so 81. 3 squared is 9, so minus 9 x squared. Now we're subtracting what happens when we replace 
y with 3x, so that's 81x to the fourth minus, so 9x squared, so x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, so minus 9x to the fourth. Okay, so we want to simplify this, collect like terms. So let's see, um, 81 minus 9 is 72. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of 81 minus 9x squared minus 72 x to the fourth. And so now we've got a simple function of x to integrate. So 81x minus 3x cubed minus 72 over 5, x to the power of 5, from 0 to 1. Okay, and so I simplify this and I get 81 minus 3 is what, 78, minus 72 over 5. So 78 times 5 is 390, so I can express that as 390 minus 72 all over 5. And so this is 318 over 5. Okay, that completes that.